Hello, my name is Dr. Joanna Kuyaba, and today in this video, I would like to discuss one of my blogs entitled In the Footsteps of Mary Magdalene Alexandria. Please check it out on my blog, Goddess News blog, by Dr. Joanna Kuyaba. So, in this video, I would like to explore the possibility which was discussed in a famous book by Margaret Starbert, The Woman with the Alabaster Jar, that after the event of crucifixion, Mary Magdalene went to Alexandria. Now, uh, Margaret Starbert, who did a very meticulous research uh, of different mythological uh, stories about uh, Mary Magdalene, uh, believe that Mary Magdalene was already pregnant with Jesus' child, uh, which was later born in Alexandria and was um, called either Sarah or Tomar, depending on the tradition. And then they went away, or when uh, they later went to France. So uh, this is a very well known story, and you're probably familiar with it already. However, uh, my take on Mary Magdalene is mostly based on the Gnostic Gospels, such as the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, such as the Gospels, uh, Gospel of Philip, and another Gnostic source, Pistis Sophia. So although I do not deny the possibility that Mary Magdalene did have a child with Jesus, my focus is different. I believe that Mary Magdalene was the leading and favorite disciple of Jesus, and in fact that uh, she represented the divine wisdom, or Sophia, within a Gnostic tradition in Jesus' life or in Christ's life. So I'm going to focus on Mary Magdalene not as a possible wife uh, of Jesus and a possible uh, mother of his child, but rather as a woman, learned woman, and in fact representation of wisdom on earth, divine wisdom on earth, and a consort to Jesus. So according, for example, to Pistis Sophia and the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, uh, and the Gospel of Mary Magdalene was found in Egypt, uh, which is interesting for our story, Later on, I'll elaborate on this. Um, Mary Magdalene is presented as uh, the leading and favorite disciple of Jesus. In the Gospel of Philip, Mary Magdalene is called Koinonos, which could be translated as a partner, as a wife, as a consort. So this is kind of well established in uh, Gnostic sources that, uh, uh, that Mary Magdalene had this kind of elevated uh, position in Jesus' life not only as his possible partner, which is, you know, possible, but uh, as the learned uh, woman and representation of divine wisdom in his life. So I would like to explore this possibility and uh, ask myself, you know, is it possible that she indeed went to Alexandria after the event of crucifixion and when she was escaping uh, Jerusalem for the fear of persecution? So, uh, I'm not going to wonder whether she had a child or not, but if she went to Alexandria, what possibly could happen there and why uh, she would like to go to Alexandria. And this is one of my favorite topics. As you know, I have many favorite topics. But Alexandria, it is important to remember that Alexandria in the first century was the center of all learning in the West, certainly, and quite possibly both in the West and in the East especially because of its famous library, the Library of Alexandria, where thousands, if not millions, of different manuscripts from around the world, both West and East, uh, were stored. And uh, it was like Paris, London, New York, Rome, Florence in the Renaissance, uh, and all other cities around the world taken together that were famous throughout the ages in learning. So this was Alexandria. It was the seat of free thinkers, of philosophers, of saintly rebels, and all kind of uh, progressive, so you could say, thought, especially related to matters of spirit, uh, soul, and philosophy, and sciences as well. So this in itself is interesting uh, as a connection with uh, Mary Magdalene as the learned woman, as she was portrayed in some of the Gnostic Gospels. However, I was also wondering if there is already some evi any evidence connecting Jesus and Mary Magdalene to Alexandria. And sometimes you can find evidence in surprising sources. So I'll just digress a little bit to explain to you that when I was writing my first book, Jerusalem Diary, it was a commissioned book, and I was asked to read Urantia book, which is, could be considered a modern source of revelation and uh, with a slightly kind of uh, Gnostic bent, uh, but not really Gnostic. 
and uh, I had to read chapter 4, which was uh, about Jesus' life. So, interestingly, in uh, this chapter about Jesus' life, I found one uh, small subchapter called In Alexandria. And according to Eurasia book, young Jesus, who was also a very learned man, not as uh, described in uh, canonical scriptures, he was a learned man, and he was known through Palestine and other places as the scribe of da Damascus because, uh, you know, he studied there for a while and, 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 and excelled in, in wisdom and in knowledge. And apparently there, he met two uh, Indian men, a father and a son, who were businessmen and who were traveling on business around the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, the merchant, the Indian merchant asked Jesus, to follow him to Alexandria to be a tutor to his son. So this is based on Urantia book. And uh, there, uh, Jesus and, and his young Indian friend uh, visited all different kinds of sites in Alexandria, especially went to the famous library of Alexandria to daily listen to uh, uh, lectures by learned professors, as it says there. It also says there that uh, Jesus wanted to meet uh, Philo of Alexandria, or Philo of Alexandria, this depends whether you pronounce it in Greek or in English, who was a, indeed a, a, a historical figure and a very famous philosopher of his time in the first century, and he lived in Alexandria. However, the Urantia book says that Jesus didn't have opportunity to meet Philo of Alexandria simply because Philo fell sick at the time, and you know, by the time uh, he felt better, Jesus and his Indian friends move on to travel to different places. So there is already a little bit of a connection between uh, the lives of Jesus and Mary Magdalene and Alexandria and uh, the famous philosopher Philo of Alexandria, which, however, Jesus did not have a chance to meet during his trip to Alexandria. Now, I was thinking, is it such an impossible thing that Mary Magdalene, as she's represented in some Gnostic uh, sources as the learned woman, would not also go to Alexandria and would not also want to meet Philo of Alexandria after the event of crucifixion. After, I believe that after the event of crucifixion, she must have been, you know, heartbroken and sad and uh, she needed uh, to escape and uh, for her own safety. And uh, it seems to me that Alexandria would be a natural place for her where, uh, especially because it was a um, place uh, of free thinkers and a philosophical and spiritual center of the Western world at the time. Now, uh, of course, we don't have any factual uh, evidence, but there, are, there is a lot of kind of um, mythical evidence that connects Mary Magdalene uh, with Egypt, and some of the stories are more wild than others. However, I would like to consider this possibility simply because, as Joseph Campbell says, myths very often tell us some general truth that was repressed from our collective memory. And it's not now uh, accessible in our collective memor memory in a, in a rational level, but it's just under the rational level in our subconscious mind. So although it cannot be trusted in a kind of, uh, with its detail, it can be trusted as a general proposition, as, as a, some kind of general truth that, that is now forgotten for us and it's worthwhile of uncovering. So this is how I'm going to consider this possibility of Mary Magdalene in Alexandria. So let's assume that she indeed, indeed go to Alexandria, the center of learning and the center of learning to which Jesus, her partner, went uh, some years later, probably about 10 years earlier, I'm sorry, 10 years earlier, and then now she went to Alexandria uh, simply because she could meet uh, learned people and it, it was also a very liberal center, so she wouldn't be prosecuted as she was in Jerusalem. It is quite interesting that also Carl Jung, who wrote his um, Gnostic work, uh, Seven Sermons for the Dead, also mentions Alexandria as the center of spiritual learning no, and not Jerusalem. But Jerusalem is not the center of spiritual learning. For uh, Carl Jung, it was Alexandria as well. So, it, on many levels, Alexandria historically and mythically was the center of learning during Mary Magdalene's uh, lifespan in, in the first century. So, I was thinking, whom could she meet and what would entice her to go to Alexandria? 
And I was thinking, you know, because times were very difficult for women at the time. And I was thinking, would it be possible that, you know, she would be even allowed into this, you know, intellectual circles uh, of philosophers in Alexandria. And in my detective work, I found this wonderful book uh, published by the Oxford University Press by John E. Taylor about women philosophers in first century Alexandria. Bingo. So I thought, okay, so there were women philosophers in the first century Alexandria, although obviously, you know, we don't know much about them. So I thought perhaps, you know, knowing that women were allowed to be scholars in Alexandria, at least to a certain degree, that a learned woman like Mary Magdalene would definitely uh, like to go there. And as I was reading the book, I noticed that, guess who wrote about this a group of philosophers that allowed women philosophers in that circle. It was an old friend, uh, Philo of Alexandria, who lived between 20 before Common Era uh, to uh, 50 of Common Era, uh, uh, then pretty much during the lifespan of Mary Magdalene in, in Jesus. So in his book, in his work, I'm sorry, De Vita Contemplativa, he writes about this uh, philosophers in Alexandria called, uh, and I'm going to try to pronounce it, it's in uh, Greek of the first century, Therapeutai, who uh, were spread around the world, but especially were, and I'm quoting, super abundant around Alexandria, uh, who allowed women philosophers into their circles. Not only that, the word Therapeutai means also the healers, and especially spiritual healers or soul healers, which has a kind of Gnostic ring to it, because Gnostics believe, you know, in uh, spiritual healing, in the sense that Gnosis, the divine spark and knowledge or wisdom, you know, would heal you. So, uh, or, or also they were called the attendants, and this uh, attendants to the gods, especially, and especially to uh, goddess Isis, which is interesting in itself, because Alexandria was a big center of worship for goddess Isis. If you'd like to know more about the connection between Mary Magdalene and Goddess Isis, Inanna and Ishtar and Hathor, please check my Goddess News blog. I have blogs that are just about it. And I also have some um, other videos here on this channel about the lineage of goddesses that discuss it. So I'm not going to go there uh, at this stage because I already have videos and blogs about it. So this is in itself interesting. Another reason why perhaps Mary Magdalene would like to get in touch with them, it is because Taylor in her book about women philosophers in Alexandria in the first century says that the philosophers from this group were connected to the uh, Essene. Now, Essene was a Jewish mystical group that uh, lived between, uh, existed between probably about 130 BC to perhaps uh, uh, 50 uh, AD or CE, common era. And uh, they claim that John the Baptist or John the ba Baptizer, as they called him, was a part of this group. And of course, we know that John the Baptist knew Jesus because he baptized him, right? And so in a, uh, we know about this group because uh, scrolls uh, were discovered in 1947 in Qumran, in the caves of Qumran in Palestine. However, the story of the scrolls is very uh, kind of um, mysterious because it took years for them to be translated and there were all kinds of issues, you know, because apparently some very controversial information was there that, you know, some people and some inst religious institutions felt really threatened by. So, uh, however, we know that there was this kind of ascetic Jewish mystical group and uh, that they claimed John the Baptist was one of them. And those philosophers from the first century in Alexandria apparently were in contact and were somehow associated with this group from Palestine. So we already have this connection with the philosophers from first century Alexandria who allowed women in their circles, but were also somehow connected to a Jewish mystical group connected to John the Baptist from Palestine. So it could be Mary Magdalene's connection with them. Another connection of Mary Magdalene with um, Egypt is that the uh, Gnostic materials, Gnostic Gospels, such as uh, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, 
and the Gospel of Philip, which do portray her as the wise woman and as the uh, consort or partner of, uh, of Jesus, were also discovered in Egypt. So there's a strong kind of um, intuitive connection and mythical connection uh, between Mary Magdalene and Egypt. And there are obviously some other wild stories, but I'm not going to this because I want to focus on Mary Magdalene as the scholarly woman, as the representation of divine wisdom in Jesus' life, as his partner, as he was the divine love, she was the divine wisdom in his life, walking together. And I would like to think that as she was in Alexandria, accepted among the circles of philosophers there, who did accept women among them, who had a connection to Palestine, that she could actually tell her true story, that she was not a prostitute as she was made to be, you know, six centuries later by a Pope uh, who, Gregory, who, you know, just basically made up the whole story and there's no scriptural evidence for that, that she was there as the wise woman, as the consort, you know, of Christ, uh, and she could tell her true story which is now preserved for us and only relatively recently discovered, 1945, 1947, in Egypt, right? In Egypt in 1945, especially Gospel of Mary Magdalene earlier in the uh, hundred years later before, over hundred years uh, earlier before 1945 when the Gospel of Philip in Nag Hammadi and other Gnostic sources were discovered. So I believe that this is just the beginning of a story of a divine feminine and of divine wisdom. And as the Gnostics called the divine wisdom Sophia, the goddess Sophia, and I do believe that Mary Magdalene was personification of goddess Sophia in Jesus' life, that we are going to learn and learn more and more of the story and that we have to sometimes make this kind of mythical and intuitive links because the, the history was erased from us. Somebody was in control of history and and especially after the Council of Nicaea in the first century, when uh, Gospels were selected, you know, into politically correct and politically incorrect. And then even 200 years later, Mary Magdalene was made uh, into a prostitute, which I do not believe she ever was. Now we have an opportunity and I think responsibility to reclaim her name. And I think uh, more interesting things are even coming. So I would like to pay homage here to Mary Magdalene as Sophia, to Mary Magdalene as the wise woman who quite possibly did live in uh, ancient Alexandria, a center of all learning in the first century. And later in my other blogs, I may also explore the possibility whether she indeed go to France or not. But frankly, this, that story is less important for me than the story of Alexandria and Mary Magdalene as the Sophia and divine wisdom in ancient Alexandria. Thank you so much. And if you like this talk, please sign up to my YouTube channel and my Goddess News blog.